，为免综艺馆嘅节目及观众受到骚扰，请各位关掉你嘅流动电话，并将手表及全呼机嘅响闹装置关上。请勿在场内饮食或擅自摄影、录影及录音，敬请合作。Dear patrons, to avoid undue disturbance to the program and the audience. Please switch off your mobile phones as well as the beeping devices on your watches and pages before the program. Eating and drinking, as well as unauthorized photography, video, and audio recordings in the auditorium, are forbidden. Thank you for your cooperation. 为免综艺馆的节目及观众受到骚扰，请各位关掉你的手提电话。并将手表及传呼机的响闹装置关上。请勿在场内饮食或擅自摄影、录影及录音。敬请合作。Good morning, and I'm pretty stunned you all keep your tickets, as I see at the gate. Right, I think it's annoying thing, and don't blame on me. I can't help, and I think it's not. Yeah, because like yesterday we had a hot pot dinner with a bunch of you guys. Yeah, who who was there? Just stand up or raise your hand. And I'm not sure you had heard. I I spoke. I have spoken. That was the place. In some years ago, we celebrated the establishment of the Hong Kong chapter. That is a really sweet place, and then around like half month later, and bunch of Wikipedia Hong Kong Wikipedians fly to a city called Taipei, and under the Grand Hotel, we first time on a on a stage like another restaurant like thing. A lady came to us, and on a stage, and that was. Sue Gardner, and that was her first time appearance in Wikimania, and of course in the audience of Wikipedians. And I'm now welcoming Sue Gardner, our executive director. Probably this is the last time she presented on Wikimania. Good morning. So before I start, I want to call out Stephen Laporte. Is Stephen Laporte here this morning? And is Mahmoud Hashimi here? I don't think so. He lives in San Jose, but he might be here. There's Stephen. There's Stephen. Stephen, can you stand up? Stand up for like a long time. So the reason the reason I wanted Stephen to stand up is not because he is an awesome lawyer at the Wikimedia Foundation and a wonderful human being and a great Wikipedian, although all that is true, but because Stephen built this, which is built off recent changes. And what you can see is it's it's edits in multiple language versions of Wikipedia with some beautiful music behind it. My favorite part of it is the welcoming of the new users. So newly registered people get welcomed at the top top of the screen. It's really great. Thank you for making it, Stephen. So I'm Sue Gardner. I'm the executive director of the Wikimedia Foundation. Every year, as Jerry said, every year I come, I stand on this stage, and I do what I consider to be an accountability presentation、um, for the Wikimedia movement. So I'm talking to the folks in this room, the editors and the people here, but I also feel like you're very much a proxy. For the 80,000 Wikimedia editors around the world, and I'm speaking to you all. And my purpose is to tell you what the Wikimedia Foundation has done in the past year, and what it's doing in the year ahead. My clicking device is not working. Yeah. The laser is working, but the clicker is not. I have a lot of trouble keeping track. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hi, everyone. How's it going? No, we did this a thousand times. We did do this a thousand times. <laughs> I can 
do it manually if I have to. Thank you. Okay, perfect. So the four priority areas for the Wikimedia Foundation, both in 2012-13 and in 2013-14, are these. So editor engagement, grant making, the visual editor, and mobile. And like I said, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to talk through what we're doing or what we did do in 2012-13. And then I'm going to talk through what's next for 2013-14. And I'm going to start with editor engagement. So we all know that the Wikimedia movement and academics and researchers outside the movement have spent a number of years, probably three, four, five years, talking about editor retention and about the number of active editors that Wikipedia has. The Wikimedia Foundation has put a lot of energy, starting, I think, officially with the summer of research a couple of years ago. We put a lot of energy into understanding why people join Wikipedia, why they leave it, and why they don't join us in the first place. And I'm really happy to say that in 2012, 13, for the first time, we cracked it and we now know how to help those people. So we're no longer just studying them, we're actually helping them. And here's how we're doing it. So there's a small team of people at the Wikimedia Foundation who work on this problem and what they do is they make small changes to the interface and the design of the projects in an effort to make things easier for new people, more intuitive, more welcoming, and more friendly. This screen capture is something called getting started, and probably nobody in this room has ever seen this because it's what happens when you register a username for the first time on Wikipedia. This is the page that you get taken to. So you wouldn't have seen it because you would have registered long ago. It used to be that when you registered on the projects, you would get a results page that was kind of messy and, and not really customized to you, and I think it had the logos of the sister projects and then a notification that you could go back to the page from whence you had come. We've replaced it with this, and the purpose of this is to give people a set of tasks that they can do that are easy and suited um, to new editors. And so this is built off SuggestBot, which probably many of you know. And so you can choose to fix spelling and grammar, you can choose to simplify or reword sentences, or you can choose to add links to existing articles. These are all easy things for new people to do. The reason we built it was because our research was telling us that new people would join Wikipedia and they expected, because they had read about the projects, they expected that there would be a welcoming community of editors who would find them and coach them and nurture them and point them towards useful work that they could do. And that didn't happen. And they talk about sometimes coming into the projects and feeling a bit lost and not knowing how to get started. So the purpose of this is to help people do that. We, in this room, probably will not be surprised to know that fixing spelling and grammar is the number one thing that people do when they hit this page. And the reason that shouldn't be surprising to us is because so many of us, that's how we started, right? You see a typo, it's how I started. You see a typo, you fix it, you feel that little rush, that small amount of fulfillment, and then you go on to do more. And it does succeed. So on the left here is the control group of people who register on the English Wikipedia, 20% of them go on within 24 hours to successfully complete their first edit in an article. Of people who get the getting started page, 22%, so an additional 2% of them go on to successfully edit within their first 24 hours. That doesn't sound like a lot, it's only 2%, but this is really a pretty small intervention into the projects. What the 2% represents with 130,000 new registered users every month on the English Wikipedia, that's another 2,600 um, editors every month on English Wikipedia. So you can imagine how that adds up. We sometimes get asked if the getting started users are reverted at a higher rate, so are we really just opening the floodgates um, for vandals and bad faith editors? Unsurprisingly, um, we're not the getting started people get reverted at the same rates as everybody else. And so the team is going to be doing more in the coming year, this kind of thing, very small incremental interface changes, and they are going to be increasing the number of um, editors by doing that. What's ahead on editor engagement in the coming year? Um, some of you will have attended a workshop the other day on what we're calling Flow. Flow is a project designed to fix talk pages um, on the projects. And if you look at this, we're all really used to this and we know how to parse it, we know how to make sense of it. We also know from our research and from common sense that this is completely unintuitive for new people, right? They look at that, they don't understand who, they don't even necessarily understand people are talking. 
They certainly don't understand who's talking to who, what the indentations mean, are there multiple different conversations happening here? What do four tildes mean? Do I talk on your talk page? Do you talk on my pa talk page? They may not even know that this is a discussion space. Obviously, when new people come into the projects, one of the most important things that needs to happen is we need to be able to engage them in a dialogue with other editors, right? That's how we learn, that's how we construct the knowledge that's in the projects. And so it's critical that new people have a way to engage in conversation with other editors and that they have a way to do it early. And so going forward in 2013-14, we're gonna be working on a big project to revamp talk pages and try to make them much more intuitive and much more useful for new people. It's gonna be complex and it's gonna be pretty fraught because we are all used to this and it's pretty core, pretty central to the Wikimedia experience, but that's a thing that we're gonna focus on in the coming year. <clears throat> I'm gonna talk now about grant making. So the Wikimedia movement has been giving out grants for a number of years now. Um, probably the first grant givers out were uh, the Wikimedia Foundation, maybe the German chapter, possibly also the French chapter. Last year, we took a massive uh, leap forward in our ability to give out grants and in the amount of money that we gave out as a movement together. And it looks like this. So last year, the Wikimedia Foundation gave out just over five and a half million US dollars to about 35 organizations around the world and to many, many hundreds of individual volunteers. So what you see on the right here is a chart of how that breaks down. So it's Germany, France, the United Kingdom, Switzerland and the Netherlands, India, Argentina, and 27 other countries. The Global North um, gets the sort of lion's share of the dollars that we give out. About 95 cents of every dollar goes to the Global North and about five cents of every dollar goes to the Global South. What we did in 2012-13 was we established the Funds Dissemination Committee, which is a volunteer-led group of people who make recommendations to the Wikimedia Foundation Board of Trustees for where the money should go. This past year, I would say that what we focused on mainly was the infrastructure of grant making. We were doing a lot more grant making, a much bigger scale than we had ever done before. And so we had to focus on process and systems and structures and you know, just how the mechanics of the work were done. I was really pleased with the FDC in its first year because I think it was successful not only in that the trains went on time and the money was successfully given out, which is no small thing in and of itself. But also I think the FTC made some pretty tough decisions. They did a lot of work. They were, I think, very thoughtful. And I think that the decisions that they made were good ones. Going forward next year, um, the Wikimedia Foundation will be giving out up to $8 million around the world. So the overall envelope of funding for the movement is growing pretty significantly. Um, and we're gonna change our emphasis a little bit. So now that we have the basics in place for grant making, what we're gonna be able to focus on next year, in this year, this coming year, is um, the effectiveness of the work that the money is funding. And so what that means is, for the first time, kind of systematically as a movement, we're gonna be asking ourselves some fundamental questions about what is the work that the money is funding how is the work helping the Wikimedia movement reach its goals? Where should we focus more of our attention? What kinds of programmatic activities should we do more of? And what do we think, you know, in retrospect, after some analysis, maybe aren't worth putting our energy into? So a lot of people in this room are involved in projects like Wiki Loves Monuments, like Edit-a-thons, like Wikipedia Academies, um, teaching Wikipedia editing to people in a variety of ways. And what we're gonna be doing together in the coming year is working together to figure out which of those things is most effective and which ones we should concentrate on. Visual editor. So the purpose of the visual editor is to allow people to edit without their having to learn wiki syntax. The visual editor should enable more readers to become editors. But I actually don't want people to think of the visual editor purely as something for new people. It is designed for new people, and the reason we're building it is because new people are um, too deterred by wiki syntax. But my hope, and I think the hope of the people building it, is that in the fullness of time, it's going to be so efficient and so effective and so user-friendly friendly for lots of different kinds of tasks 
that most editors will use it for most purposes. It's not there now, but that's what we're hoping will happen. So I wanna step back for a second um, and talk about why we all want it. So we've been talking about the visual editor as, as a community globally, probably since about 2003 or 2004. It wasn't until 2009 that the Wikimedia Foundation was big enough and was starting to have enough engineers to even imagine taking on such a large and complicated engineering project. And so in 2009, um, to sort of validate our perceptions about editing, we hired a firm called Bolt Peters, uh, a usability firm, and asked them to conduct some tests for us. So what they did was they found us a bunch of people who could have been editors and who ideally we would have wanted to have been editors. So people with advanced degrees, people who were educated, people who had some life experience, they had some knowledge, they should be able to share it on Wikipedia. They brought them together, they asked them to push the edit button and then they recorded the responses of those people. They recorded what happened. So I'm gonna show you that now. Nah. Nah. And what's making you say nah here? I have no clue how to do that. Okay. Toolbox, red iron, template. Oh, look at all that. I don't want to know about it. No, I can't do it. I cannot add a section if I have no idea how to add a section. Okay. Well. That's fairly, it's a lot more than I'm willing to mess with. It's quite a bit of uh, HTML, mm -hmm. so forget it, folks. I'm getting fairly frustrated. <laughs> Not do it at home. Overall, how'd you feel about doing all this stuff? Um, kind of stupid. <laughs> I guess this is the, the article as it is in like its basic format. How it's how the computer. You know, I don't know that much about computers. Uh huh. Sure. How the computer has how it's been put in so that it will appear the way we see it. It's kind of hard to read in this format, I have to say, because it has all this almost. I don't know. I don't know how to call it. Title, author, work, date, access date, reference, reference. It's formatted so that the computer can read it, I uh -huh. guess, or whoever reads it, whatever. I don't know that much about it. Until sure, sure. This interface is more confusing than now. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, this is pretty scary to me. Well, yeah. like, there's, like, all this, I don't know, it just looks, like, hard to read. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. like, like there's all these brackets, and then, like, the reference website is here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, look at it. You have no idea what this is. So that's why we're building the visual editor, right? We're building the visual editor because we purport to contain and we want to contain the sum total of all human knowledge. And if there are huge swaths of the population who click edit and just back away slowly frightened, um, we're not gonna achieve our goals, right? So we need to make it easier for new people to edit Wikipedia. So this chart shows the development of the project over time. It goes back to December of 2011. And what it shows us is the blue line is uh, bugs and feature requests opened, and then the orange dotted line is bugs and features requests closed. And so if you look back at the very beginning of the project, you can see you know, it was not a lot of feedback coming in, and what feedback was coming in was probably mostly developers reporting things to other developers. And then you see when we went into alpha mode, we start getting some more, and when we went into beta mode, we start getting lots and lots more. And so what we're focused on today as a group is getting feedback from a wide range of real users. And so some of you probably have gone to what we're calling the Visual Editor Lounge, which is behind the Chapters Village down near where lunch is served. And so people can go there and they can meet the engineers who are building it. And they can talk to them and ask them their questions and use Visual Editor and kind of hack away on it. It's particularly useful for us if people um, 
if people are using it in multiple languages, we need to get lots of feedback on how it's working in different language versions. And so in the room, they've been going through some use cases and, um, and sort of imagining different kinds of people's experiences. As we continue developing the project, we need to get a lot of feedback from a very wide diversity of people. Obviously, we're not gonna take away the bugs that have been reported so far and then you know, like code up a bunch of stuff in a room and then launch something to everybody. That's not how it works, right? We're gonna do it in an iterative fashion. We're gonna continue developing and relaunching, re-releasing all the time. Look, it's Liam's mother. <laughs> Liam's mother, everybody. <laughs> Okay, so we wanna ask you to please continue to test, um, to test the visual editor and please continue to reporting on your experiences. We're very, very, very grateful for the feedback that we're getting from you all. Okay, lastly, I'm gonna talk about mobile. So the way we think about mobile at the Wikimedia Foundation, 2011-12 uh, was the year of mobile readership, 2012-13 the year of uploading, and 2013-14 was the year of editing from the mobile web. So what this chart shows is, uh, the most important part of this chart is the orange dotted line, which shows um, the percentage of all internet usage that came from mobile devices. Okay, so that's kind of the baseline or a benchmark. And then if you look at the dark blue line, that is the percentage of Wikimedia project usage that came from mobile devices. And so if you look at the beginning, around 2011, at the far left of the chart, we're kind of underperforming against the internet as a whole, right? We have fewer people using Wikipedia and our projects for mobile devices relative to the rest of the world and their mobile usage. And then what you see is over time, due to the work of Thomas and his team, over time we release an Android app, we release an iOS app, we fix up the mobile site, et cetera, et cetera. We start to overperform against the marketplace or against what is standard and conventional. And so what this shows us is, you know, page views continue to increase. That's not surprising. Mobile is growing everywhere. And then more to the point, we're doing better. We're overperforming against sort of what is average. 2012-13, so that was 2011-12, was fixing readership. 2012-13, um, we made uploading significantly easier, uploading of images significantly easier from people's mobile devices. Has anyone in this room used the Wiki Loves Monuments app that we built? Yeah, okay, great, yeah. And then on through the rest of the year, we built other things, we made it a lot easier. You can now um, go to Wikipedia from your phone, find articles near you that are missing images, and you can then go and take an image and upload it into that article. We've put a lot of emphasis on that, obviously because you know something that is really easy and really ordinary for people to do with their phones is take a lot of pictures, and we want a lot of pictures. And so you might think that when we gave that ability to users, we would get a lot of really bad images, right? We would get a lot of sort of selfies or whatever. And that did actually happen in the beginning. <laughs> but over time, we started getting some really, really beautiful pictures. So these are all from people's cell phones. a rescue badger. <laughs> and so they're gorgeous, right? I mean, it's fantastic that now we're getting people giving us photographs who otherwise maybe never would have, and some of them are just beautiful. So 2013-14 is the year in which you begin to be able to edit uh, from the mobile version of Wikipedia, from the mobile web. And so on the left-hand side, that's the ordinary interface that you see if you use Wikipedia, the mobile web version on your phone. So that's where we are, the Holly Hong Kong Polytechnic University. And then on the right, if you click in, if you click edit, that's wiki syntax. So it's just plain wiki syntax. You're not getting the visual editor on your phone. You're not getting any extra, you know, more supportive, more user-friendly experience. If you had asked me, um, certainly two years ago, probably last year, maybe even six months ago, if you had asked me if I thought people wanted to do this, even from tablets, I would have said no. Um, and I was wrong, I've been proved wrong. So in the first week since we launched the ability to do that, more than 3,000 people edited from their phones. And what was surprising to me also, and interesting, is that 65% of them are new editors. So they're people who, for whatever reason, never edited from a laptop or a desktop. They had their first editing experience on Wikipedia from the mobile phone. 
I have no way of knowing what's inside that numbers, what, that, what those numbers mean. It might mean that it's the wave of people coming online um, in Global South countries who are mobile only. We don't know. We don't know if they're different in, in type and nature and kind from existing Wikipedia editors. But there are certainly, they, there are a new cohort, there are a new group of people coming in. Again, to reversion rates, because we are always asked this, the reversion rate of mobile editing is 1% higher than the ordinary um, default reversion rate. So people get reverted normally about 4% of the time. Mobile people get reverted about 5%. So why does mobile matter? Mobile matters because mobile is the future, right? Most of us uh, went on the internet for the first time 10 or maybe even 20 years ago, and we did it from desktops and we did it from laptops. And that was sort of the, the, the frame for our experience. That was how we understood the internet. The mobile experience is a new and additional experience for us. But we know that all around the world, um, in India and in many other countries, people are coming online for the first time using their mobile devices, and they may never experience the internet in any way other than through a mobile device. And so mobile matters. It matters that people be able to read the projects on their mobile devices, and it matters that they be able to edit the projects on their mobile devices. We used to have a saying around um, Wikimedia, which I think probably people still say sometimes, which was, you know, Wikipedia is not, does not want to be written by people in rich countries for people in poor countries, right? We want everybody to continue, to contribute. We want everybody to share the knowledge that they've got. And so mobile is critical for that. That's why mobile matters. I want to show you a video. And I'm going to, before I do, I'm going to ask Victor to stand up if he's here. <laughs> You're, you're applauding Victor on principle because you don't yet know what he's done. <laughs> but what, what Victor has done is, um, so, so, so we have a project at the Wikimedia Foundation, which I'm sure everybody here knows about, which is called Wikipedia Zero. Does everyone know? Can you put up your hand if you know what it is? OK. It's great. Yes, let's applaud Wikipedia Zero. <laughs> So it's a great project. All we do is we persuade cool, goes around and persuades mobile firms to give away free access to Wikipedia, so letting people access Wikipedia without paying data charges. Um, earlier this year, a very surprising thing happened. We did not expect this. We did not plant the seed for this. We did not know this was going to happen. Um, and when we heard at the Wikimedia Foundation about the story, we sent Victor out to document it for us, to kind of find out what was going on and, um, and, and tell us the story. So I'm going to ask Chip backstage now to um, play us that short video. <laughs> Hi, this is a letter which me and my classmates, my classmate wrote to access Wikipedia for free. It goes as follows: Open letter to Salsi, MTN, Fodacom, and ATA. We are learners in Grade 12 at Sinjong High School. Just Lobo Park, Nunatim, Cape Town. We recently heard that in some other African countries like Kenya and Uganda, cell phone providers are offering their customers free access to Wikipedia. We think this is a wonderful idea and would really like to encourage you also to make the same offer here in South Africa. Our school does not have a library. 90% of us have cell phones, but it is expensive for us to buy airtime so if we could get free access to Wikipedia, it would make a huge difference to us. Normally, when we do research, Wikipedia is one of the best sites and there is information on just about every topic. Think of the boost that it will give us as students and to the whole education system of South Africa. Our education system needs help and having access to Wikipedia would make a very positive difference. Thank you. 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 And goes. Thank you. Thank you.
So I cry every time I see that. <laughs> so why did I show you that? I, I showed it to you because it was gorgeous. <laughs> that is one of the reasons I showed it to you. But I showed it to you because of, um, I think it reminds us of uh, something that we may sometimes risk forgetting, which is Wikipedia matters, right? Some of us use it to settle bar bets and find out about Simpsons episodes and so on, and there is nothing wrong with that use. But there are lots of people in the world for which it is really important. It really matters. Um, I want to take a minute to uh, reflect. So I have been uh, your executive director since 2007. Um, as has been announced or you know, announced months ago and talked about earlier at this conference, at the end of this year or sometime towards the end of this year, I'm going to leave my position as your executive director, which I have been for the last six or so years. Um, and so I want to reflect for a second on what has happened in that time and what it means to me and what I think it means to us. When I joined the Wikimedia Foundation, Wikipedia was still, I think, widely considered, including by us, um, as, 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 as shaky and, and unsure, right? It was good and it was popular and it was getting better all the time. But it was still a, a website that, you know, schools discouraged kids from using um, and it was often sort of the butt of jokes in the media and so forth. Everybody used it. Uh, but they were, um, they were embarrassed by their use of it, right? Like it was very common for people to say, oh yes, I do actually use Wikipedia, you know? And that is so far in our history now, that is just not where we're at at this point. At the Wikimedia Foundation, you know, um, we have the Global Ed Program and we constantly have universities from around the world, very prestigious universities, wanting to work with Wikipedia. Harvard University was one of our first partners in the Global Education Program. We look at something like Wikipedia Zero. Those students don't think Wikipedia is a joke, right? They're using Wikipedia. They know that it's important. So I've been really proud to be your executive director over the last period of years. It's been an extraordinary um, time in my life, and I have found it to be quite a radicalizing experience. And when I think about why I'm leaving, there are probably two major contributing factors. And the first is, I feel really proud and really happy that I think the projects now are safe. I think they were vulnerable um, when I joined the Wikimedia Foundation. We all know the story. It was very tiny. It was very broken. It didn't have a lot of money. It didn't have a lot of expertise. I feel like today, yesterday, I was at the, uh, the legal workshop, the legal clinic, watching our lawyers talk about the defense of the projects that they do and talking about how they handled DMCA takedown notices and talking about the, the legal defense that they provide sometimes for individual editors. And you're safe, you're protected. The servers are installed, the site runs fine. We are now capable of doing big engineering projects. I feel like Wikipedia's future um, is assured and I feel like I've, I've made a contribution to that and that makes me really happy. So I feel like it's safe for me to leave at this point. Um, and I also feel like Wikipedia is in terrific shape and what I am concerned about is everything else on the internet. So when we think about the internet that we imagined, and I'm old enough and many of us in the room are old enough to remember life before the internet. When we think about the internet that we imagined back then that people like Jimmy thought about when they made Wikipedia and things like it, we imagined the internet as being like a city, right? Like there would be commerce, there would be um, you know, banks and restaurants and clothing stores. But we also imagined that there would be more to the internet than that, that there would be parks and libraries and schools. And a friend of mine said something really interesting to me a couple of years ago that took years to sink in. He said, Wikipedia is the only thing. He said, you keep talking about Wikipedia like there's this flourishing ecosystem of things like Wikipedia. There is only Wikipedia. It's the only popular, high profile, uncompromising, useful, public service website that's out there. That's obviously not entirely true, but there's some truth to it. Wikipedia in some ways is the exception. It's not the rule, right? It's the unusual thing, not the usual thing. And so what I'm gonna do, I don't know what I'm gonna do, but what I'm gonna be focused on figuring out is what kind of contribution I can make 
towards developing the internet in such a way that it becomes the thing that we originally wanted it to be, right? So that it becomes not a commercialized wasteland, but something that's useful, where people can share and help each other. <laughs> and so I wanna say, um, I have loved my time with you guys. I am not gonna be your ED, but I'm always, 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 always gonna be your friend and your supporter, and I thank you. Thank you, Sue. Thank you. You are extraordinary. <laughs> um, that goes both ways. So I'm just going to uh, help out with a quick question and answer with Sue, um, although I don't think this is the only chance you'll have to talk to her. Uh, she'll be here through the day. But um, we have some microphones. Are there some folks with microphones? By the way, I'm Jay Walsh. I work with Sue. I'm the communications director for the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, and I want to make sure we have some microphones. So if you have a question, uh, we're going to need you to have a mic, and that way we can hear you. Uh, well, yeah, you can start raising your hands. And I think um, the board Q&A is right afterwards, right? Yes. So people will also have the option of asking questions of board members. That's right. Guys, you have some wireless mics back there if you don't have one. The wireless microphone. One second. There we are. In the, and okay, over on the side. Sorry, there is this gentleman standing over here, uh, right, with his hand raised. Yep. Keep your hand raised, please. Where Thank you. He? Right there. There we go. Okay, please go ahead. Am I the pastor? Sorry. Yeah. Okay, um, my name is Abbas from Kenya. <clears throat> um, um, last year, the Wikimedia Foundation gave uh, an un unrestricted grant to CIS India. So um, does the Wikimedia Foundation intend to give out unrestricted grants to unaffiliated organizations? And how do you see that roll out in the future? Can you, can you say, does the Wikimedia Foundation intend to continue to give out grants to? Unrestricted. Oh. Unrestricted grants. Unrestricted, unrestricted grants to unaffiliated organizations. Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I hesitate. I can see Anasu in front of me, and I'm trying to read her face. <laughs> um, <laughs> sometimes I just want to defer to the people who actually know the answer. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we do give out unrestricted grants. The FDC grants are all unrestricted. Um, and I, the CIS grant is unrestricted, and we're working towards the Brazilian grant, which will also be unrestricted, right? Um, what, can you say a little bit more about why you're asking the question? Like, what, no, what is I, it? I'm not talking about the FDC grants. Yeah. I'm talking about unrestricted grants to unaffiliated organizations like CIS India. So right. do you see the Wikimedia Foundation giving out grants like that to right. other organizations in the future? Right. Okay, so it's a slightly broader question. Yeah. yeah, so I do, actually, I do. And I think that we should, and I think that we can. We've had lots of conversations at the Wikimedia Foundation about to what extent should we be supporting organizations, like, for example, Creative Commons or the EFF, right? Um, and we think that we should be doing that. And part of the reason that we think that we should be doing that is because when you're doing fundraising, um, if, you, if you are hard to explain to donors or if you don't have an obvious way to make money, um, it can be really hard. And that has nothing to do with the merits of the work that you're doing, right? So Wikipedia, we're in such an incredibly fortunate position where we have half a billion readers. And so us making money is, is a straightforward process. All we need to do is persuade some small percentage of those people to give, and then we're completely fine. And when we look around at other organizations, um, they, 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 they have a harder time, maybe just because their work is complex. And we, as a movement, we're in a position where we, we, we know who the good guys are, right? Like we know who is being helpful. 
Um, and so it makes sense that we would offer them some kind of support. Now, we haven't done very much of that. There is a small amount of money, I think, in our legal and community advocacy um, department budget for exactly that kind of advocacy-related um, grant making. Uh, we haven't given out a lot of money historically, and obviously we would want to only give money to organizations that are what we might call like-minded, like right? So there would need to be vetting processes and so forth, and we would want to make sure that what we were doing was consistent with what the community wanted us to do, but certainly we have considered it, and we have done a little bit of it, and I would not be surprised if we did more of it. Thanks, Sue. Um, same aisle, there's a question. There we go, thank you. It's on? Okay. Um, hi, Chris from Indonesia. And my question is about a, something that stood out to me, well, like an elephant in a china shop, basically. Um, we've been focusing on closing the gender gap over the past couple of years. And I noticed in the presentation you gave earlier, there wasn't really any discussion of that. How have we been doing in that area over the past year? Yeah, it's a really good question. And 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 I would, I would question uh, or I would challenge a little bit the assumption that we've been focusing a lot on it. I think we've been talking a lot about it, but honestly, from the perspective of like programmatic activities and resources dedicated to it, we haven't done very much. Um, someone told me the other day they were at a Wikimedia event somewhere and people were saying that they were tired of the emphasis on the gender gap. I mean, you know, there's lots of people and people say a lot of things. But uh, I, I, I don't think there's much to be tired of because we really haven't put a whole lot of effort into it. What we've done is we've talked in the media and I think that that is the starting point for any kind of um, useful activity, right? We need to name the problem before you can begin to solve the problem. We've done a little bit of research into it and there have been a couple small projects um, uh, attempting to directly address it. Frankly, the single most um, effective thing that I think anybody in the movement has done to address the gender gap is the Global Ed program, right? Which is the program in which uh, university professors assign article writing as classwork for their students. Uh, girls and women are well represented in post-secondary education. Most of the world, I think they're 50%, or maybe a little bit more in some parts of the world. And uh, we had the opportunity with Global Ed both to tap into that audience, and I think, Frank, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think in the Global Ed work that we've done, more than half of the contributors consistently are female. But we also have the opportunity with the Global Ed work to work with women's schools, right? And we have done some of that, I think, in Egypt. And I think in Egypt, the numbers are even higher. I think I'm remembering 65%. It might even be higher than that. Uh, those are the programs that have been, I think, most effective for us um, in attracting women. But it's a hard problem, right? It's a hard problem because the seeds are in the origins of Wikipedia and it will take time um, for us to shift in that regard. Because we're a peer-to-peer -peer thing, right, where it's friends teaching friends and you know somebody who edits Wikipedia, it seems more normal to you to edit, et cetera, et cetera, um, it's gonna take a long time for it to shift. I don't think it's going to shift through top-down initiatives mandated by the Wikimedia Foundation or a chapter, I think it's gonna shift through the actions and the activities of individual editors. Thanks, Sue. Okay. Questions from over here on the side. Can you, can you get the microphone back to the runner microphone? Where is it? Please, over here. Can, uh, right over, over there, here. To the, there's somebody standing in the back, about uh, just at the back of the folks up here. <coughs> uh, over here, please. Just head up this aisle and just keep your hand raised. There you are, this gentleman standing up. There he is. <coughs> Excuse me. Yes. It, it, it is the nature of sound and physics. Is that Josh? <laughs> that you do need a microphone. Is it Josh? <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Hello. Okay, fine. Then you, well, they gave me the microphone, so thanks. Um, so, hi, Sue. Hi, guys. I think you already know me. But anyway, if, if you don't, I'm Josh Lim. I'm from the Philippines. Um, I am just very curious because I know that you are leaving the foundation too and what I am generally curious about is whether or not there will be, um, we will, con it's like, what I'm curious about is whether or not there will be a change in direction or a change in how we're conducting outreach programs in the so-called global south. Um, especially as, um, as somebody who comes from a developing country where I do know that there is a lot of potential for Wikimedia in these countries. What I would like to know is whether or not your departure will have any impact on the way the foundation will conduct um, 
movement activities in developing countries or whenever your successor is selected or so on and so forth? Sure, yeah. And, um, and the answer to that is not entirely knowable, right? Because we don't have the next executive director yet, and the next executive director is gonna need to have the freedom to imagine um, the world as, as they think it, it, should, it should be conducted, right? I will say, though, and, and it might be something that the board wants to speak to when they do their Q&A, but I will say that in general, um, I and the board and the staff of the Wikimedia Foundation are pretty comfortable and pretty happy with the, with the path that we're on and with the trajectory that we're taking. I'm not gonna speak, um, sp well actually no, I will speak briefly specifically about the Global South programs. So we, in, in my opinion, the Wikimedia Foundation, we, we fumbled around a little bit before we found our feet, right? I think that's totally fine. I think that's how these things work, right? You need to experiment, you need to try stuff out and then iterate towards better. And I would say that where we're at right now um, seems to me to be the right place for us. It makes sense for uh, the Wikimedia Foundation to fund activities in the Global South, and it makes sense for those activities to be conducted and carried out by people on the ground, not by people from San Francisco. That was always a principle that we had in our work, but we didn't do it in a way that I think was super, super, super effective, and I think we have it a little bit better um, a little bit better nailed right now. So I would say that, um, you know, again, this is something that the board should speak to, but I don't think that the board is um, setting out to find an executive director who's going to move the organization in a dramatically different direction. I think what we're setting out to do is to find someone who wants to build on the work that's been done. They'll come in and certainly they will have their own ideas about how things ought to go and they're entitled to and they ought to have their own ideas. But I don't think that we're looking for a person who's gonna you know, make it into a big change project and make dramatic change. Okay. You first. Okay, there's a, there's a gentleman holding a large musical, musical instrument <coughs> over here on the far right. If you can't miss it, there you go. It's microphone shaped. There we are. Thank you. It's called a Vuvuzela. <laughs> Hi, my, my name is Dumisani Ndubani. I'm from Wikimedia South Africa. I'm currently the president there. And uh, Sue, I've got two questions for you. Okay. Uh, later today, we'll be doing a panel um, for Activating Africa, and I'll be sitting there and I've got my views on these two questions I'm going to ask for you, to you. So if you want to come to that panel, you can hear my view. But what's your view on uh, activating Africa? Do you think Wikimedia Foundation has done enough in your uh, tenure to activate Africa? I'm talking about the uh, cool projects that we've seen like Wikimedia, uh, Wikimedia Zero. Have we allocated enough funds to make it viable, to make it sustainable as well? And uh, what about the existing structures in, uh, in, the, in the community? Are they conducive to uh, formative groups in uh, developing countries to form? Is bureaucracy there not an impediment for these groups to form? What's your thought? Right, so, um, so what, what I'll, one thing I'll say is that um, I think Wikipedia Zero is a great project, right? I think it makes a lot of sense reducing barriers to access to Wikipedia and making it possible for people to read it for free just makes a lot of sense. And it's something that's easy to do from San Francisco, right? There, there's no benefit to being somewhere else. It's something the Wikimedia Foundation is very, very well positioned to do. We have the relationships with the mobile carriers, et cetera. Um, in terms of activities inside Africa, we're not the experts, right? And so our focus, when it comes to on-the-ground activities around the world, our focus is to um, catalyze, to empower, to support the work of the editors who are on the ground. Personally, I would say, I, I have wondered in my time with the Wikimedia Foundation, I have wondered if our model for local self-organization is a model that does not fit all of the world. That's a question that I've asked myself and I think some of the board members have asked our, themselves as well. Um, the first chapters developed in, in Europe um, and I think that it's a model that's extremely well understood and, um, and very prevalent 
throughout Western Northern Europe and then to some extent throughout North America as well. A kind of membership model where you get donations, small donations from the people who support the thing and the thing operates on behalf of those members in a kind of club-like fashion, right? Um, I'm not sure if that model, I ha I've asked myself why it has taken longer for entities to self-organize in other parts of the world. It wasn't until fairly recently that we started seeing um, fast mobilization in Latin America. Um, and we haven't seen as much as one might expect, for example, in Asia, um, and very little also in Africa as well. And so I've asked myself if, our, if, our, if, if, if in some way unknowingly, not on purpose, we have made assumptions that, that derive out of the experiences of the first uh, self-organizing people, if we've made assumptions that we then kind of have tried to apply to other parts of the world where that's just not how it's done there. There's some other model that, that we didn't imagine and didn't set up for to facilitate. So I'm not sure about that. Um, I, I, I will say I have been um, happy to see uh, the development of, of regional entities, um, for example, in Latin America. I think that those, uh, that people want to chart their own paths and that finding common cause with others whose cultures are similar to them can help them, I think, accelerate and grow faster. And so seeing some of that in Africa, I think would be really great. But I think, am I right? We have two chapters in Africa right now, right? We have Kenya and South Africa. I'm not missing anybody, am I? Yeah. Oh, that's right, I'm sorry. Kenya is a user group, right? Okay, yeah, yeah. But I would, I, I, I mean, I think, I, think, I think it's people on the ground doing the work, right? And you tell us how we can support you in doing that, and we will, we will try to do it. I mean, there's a little time for, can you guys hear me? One more question, and then we really have to move on to the, to the board yeah. Q&A. Sue's not going anywhere. So, uh, okay, over here on the other side, uh, see right up here, there's a gentleman, somebody's pointing at somebody. So everybody who's pointing at that, that person, <laughs> Mike, it's a crowdsourced, Situation. <laughs> there we go. Hi, everyone. Hi, Sue. Uh, my name is Warabile Mudongo. I'm from Botswana. Uh, my question was basically speaking on behalf of other university students. I just wanted to ask uh, the involvement or what support does the Wikimedia Foundation offer? to universities and lectures and other students, basically in the Global South region. Right, so I can think um, off the top of my head of two types of things that we do. So we have the Global Ed Program, which is what I talked about earlier, right? So that's a program where experienced Wikipedians and Wikimedia Foundation staff work with university professors to help the university professor assign article writing as coursework. It started in the United States. Uh, we took a grant to improve the um, articles on public policy related topics in the United States. We use that as a kind of proof of concept. That program works really well because university students like editing Wikipedia and they're well suited to editing Wikipedia. They're researching and thinking and summarizing and synthesizing and so forth. And the professors like it because it, it makes them feel like they're doing something that's fun for the kids and also kind of inventive. Um, so we have that program. Um, anybody who is interested in learning more about that would speak either with Frank Schulenberg or with Rod Dunnikin at the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, and it is now fairly easy to set that up uh, for, for universities. The other thing um, is last year, I think it was last year, uh, the Wikimedia Foundation Board of Trustees for the first time um, approved a new model uh, for self-organization, which was called the user group. And the idea of the user group, which was modeled in part on, um, for example, Mozilla has a similar kind of um, affiliative model. The idea of the user group was that we knew there was a lot of interest on campuses and you know, in lots of places um, for people wanting to self-organize around Wikipedia and just like you know, have weekly editing sessions or you know, come together and teach other people how to edit. And they wanted to be able to do it in an informal way, you know, maybe you know, in a coffee shop or whatever. And we wanted to be able to support and recognize what they were doing and allow them to, you know, put up posters without worrying about um, misusing the logo or allow them to make and give out t-shirts to the folks who were involved in the club or the project. 
And so if something like that is interesting to you or to anyone here, I think I would point them towards AFCOM and I'm not sure what the name of the person is who I should best point them towards. Maybe the AFCOM Benza. people want to stand up. Benza. Benza, of course it's Benza. <laughs> that is Benza. <laughs> Um, and I have no idea how to tell people how to find you. <laughs> M, M or N? N like Norman 113? After this? Okay, after the board Q&A. So he will be in the AFCOM lounge. But also you could just ask anybody. It's B-E-N-C-E -E, and lots of people know him and lots of people, including me, have his email address. I just don't have it memorized. Okay. Thank you, Sue. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Should I take